Hi there, and welcome to this lecture. In this video we will learn what are subroutines in Perl and how we can use them. And we'll also look into Perl subroutine signatures, also known as passing named subroutine arguments. Let's begin. First of all, a subroutine is exactly the same thing as a function. It's a group of statements encapsulated in a single function to perform a specific task. Subroutines, aka functions, are extremely useful in any programming language to encapsulate and reuse logic in your code. Typically, each subroutine is written so that it accomplishes a very specific task. Let's look at how we can use subroutines. To define a subroutine, you can use this keyword called sub, followed by a space, and then your function, aka subroutine name. I'm going to call my function test, and the logic that should be executed by the subroutine is in these curly brackets. We have written our first function. If I go to the console and try to run my script, which is... Oop, which is Perl script.pl, we can see nothing. And this is because, well, we have defined our subroutine and it is a valid context, but there are two issues. First of all, <laughs> it doesn't do anything. So let's change that. Let's say I wanted to print hello, exclamation mark, and backslash n for new line, save this. We have encapsulated the logic, but we're not calling it because the subroutine is not going to be invoked by default. If you want to invoke a subroutine, you can say test, which is our subroutine name, followed by parentheses and then semicolon. Now, if we do this, rerun our script, we're gonna see hello. Now, this is all great and all, but what if we wanted to accept some parameters? And let's say that parameter was a name and we wanna say hello, someone. The way how you can pass in arguments is by using a list context between these parentheses where you have defined your function name. So let's say I wanna say John. So that's my first argument. But how can we get this argument into our function itself? All the arguments in function is held in this special variable. We haven't seen this before, but basically think of it as just an array. So all the arguments being passed into your subroutine is going to be held into this magical array. Item at index position zero is going to be John. This array is going to hold this string at position one. Technically, we should be able to say my name equals, this is just a normal array, but with this special notation. How we can access items on array is we either use the dollar sign syntax followed by square brackets, index position zero, save this. Oh, we actually wanna now interpolate the name. We save this and go back to the console and rerun it. And here we see, hello, John. It might be clearer if we say that this is my args, and I just copy all the values there. There's nothing really special about this array, apart from that it holds the values passed into the function. So here we would be just copying these arguments, and then we could say, instead of this underscore, we are just saying args, right? Because we learned about it before. You access specific elements in your array using dollar sign notation, followed by square brackets. We save this, rerun it, it works as before. And just to quickly show uh, another alternative is that we could have used a shift function, right? We could shift off items from our array, which is this special one holding all the elements. And when we call shift, we get the first item in the list and it should be the name. And here we go. Hello, John. This is also where references become very apparently useful because if we wanted to pass a array or a hash, we wouldn't be able to pass the content as a whole, right? Because what would end up happening is that all the items from array and a hash would be spread into this special array. We wouldn't be able to pass the whole structure. Let me show you an example. So let's say I have my array that holds quote word, just that through three strings, which is A, B, and C. Now, how can I get a full structure without simply spreading the array elements into this special function argument placeholder. Let's see what happens first. If we just try to pass an array. I'm going to remove this. I'm going to say, now I want to print the dumper and I'm going to print all the arguments on this special array. And here I'm passing in array. I save this up and here we go. So basically argument one was A, argument B was at position two and argument C was, you know, at position three. You might want that, but 
Most likely you didn't. Maybe you just wanted to pass in the whole data structure. And this is where you can use references. So as we looked at before, you can use backslash to get a reference of your array. And now if we debug this special argument placeholder, we're going to see that we passed in, oops, need to save my file, passed in a reference. So we didn't copy all the values into the special array. We actually just said, this is a reference in memory to this array. Now what we could do, for example, in our function, we could move the print statement out and say, I want to print out my array, but I want to do something in this function. And let's say I wanted to push something on this array inside the function. And then let's see how array changes. First of all, I want to get my array ref, which I passed in into the function. And I can do this by shifting off the first argument of array. So I'm going to say my arg equals shift special array. So the argument should be the array reference. I can use push arg. I need to dereference it and say this is a array reference. And I want to say from function. So I'm going to push a new string on this array inside my function after running it. And now I say print. And here we go. Now I have four elements on my array. And we push this from function string here when we passed in array reference. Let's quickly look at variable scope. So we know that if we, for example, say my scalar equals hello, and we would try to reuse this my scalar and define a value of something else, it would complain that, hey, it looks like you have another scalar defined with the same name. This does not count when you're using functions, because in functions, you are in a different scope. So this curly bracket and this curly bracket indicates that this is scope of the function. For example, let's get rid of the this code and just say hello, summation mark, and this, and we're gonna call our function, but we have no more array and we don't print anything. If I call this, it looks all good, but if I'm gonna say my scalar, equals a, save this, go to the console, print it out. We don't complain. My variable scalar masks earlier declaration in same scope. Now, if I move this scalar into here and rerun the function, it's not gonna complain because, well, my scalar is defined inside the test function and the scalar bullet is defined into our main file. If I try to use the scalar, you might be wondering if it's going to use the scalar which is defined outside the function or it's going to use the scalar which is defined inside the function. And let's see. If I run this, and you might have guessed it right. It actually used the scalar inside the function because that's the local scope scalar. And it wouldn't make sense if we had a variable with the same name which is outside the function. We're redefining it and we try to print something and it's re-referencing the value of scalar which is outside the function. Another thing to note is that you can define multiple subroutines. So I can say test2 and I can say print hello from test2. Now the thing is that you can call subroutines from another subroutine. So let's replace this with hello from test save it up. Also to note the order of how you define subroutines do not matter. For example, if you had a scalar with a value hello and you try to print that before the definition of scalar, that would complain. It's not the case with subroutines. These are actually initialized at compile time. So you can do test, so you call the test subroutine from test2, which is defined before test. And let's replace it with test2 and we run our code. And here we go. We see hello from test and hello from test2 because we are calling test function, which is defined here inside the test2 function, which is called here. Now, a good thing to note is that I would advise you to always be explicit when you are returning data in your function. It's good to define when you want to return void context through return on def, or you actually want to return some value or calculated value. And Perl functions are always going to return the last value you worked with. So you don't need specifically have a return statement. For example, if I say print dumper, and here I'm going to call the test function. Let's say this function does one thing, which is defines variable A, and it's number one, and it defines variable B, which is number two. So it does A plus B 
and assign it to my C. So if we save this and we run the logic, it's going to say it's on def because we are explicitly returning on def. If we remove this return statement and call the function, it's going to return three. So sometimes you don't actually want to return the last value which you calculated from your function, but only do the calculations and do some printing or call another function. But the problem is that if you don't explicitly say that, hey, I didn't want to return anything, then it might be confusing for the caller. It's just a good practice to say, either you want to return C explicitly as such, or, or you don't want to return anything as we did initially so by saying on def. Now, as promised, I did say before that we're going to explore subroutine signatures. Subroutine signatures were introduced in Pro version 5.20 and it was classified as experimental until 5.34. However, the experimental warning was removed at 5.36, which is the version currently I'm working with when making this video. If I say Pro version, I'm going to see that this is 5.36. A very good timing to explore subroutines. Now, how you can use subroutines with signatures is by using this program called use feature and then you import a specific feature you want to use. In this case, you can use quote word notation that we looked at before. And since it's a single name, we can say signatures. And that's it. We should now be able to use signatures in our pro code. Let's remove this body syntax and let's return back to the print. Hello exclamation mark, semicolon. Let's invoke our function as such. Let's remove the print. And let's say we wanted to print out the name. So how we did it before, we were passing in an argument in list context, which we then got from this special array, which is at symbol underscore. Now with signatures, we can actually define what arguments are going to receive in this function. So if I say parentheses, and I'm gonna say that I want to receive a name. If I run this, it's going to complain. It's gonna to say too few arguments for subroutine main package, which is this file and test. And it says that it got zero and expected one. And that's true because we're requesting one argument. And by default, if you use sub subroutine signatures and you define arguments as such, they are required. And since I'm not passing an argument here, it complains. I can fix that by saying, John again, save the file. We run the script and it works. It says, hello, John. So what if you didn't want to have mandatory arguments? You can use equals notation and set the value to undefined, which means that the default when not set is going to be undefined. Or you can just say, for example, a string, which is Bob. So if there is no argument provided for this test function, then I want this argument, which is name, to have a value of Bob. If I rerun this, it's going to say, hello, Bob. Now, one thing to note is that if you do want to have an argument which is required, you must have it before the argument which is not required. So let's say name is optional, but last name isn't. So I need to have the last name before the name. Otherwise, you're going to get a warning that says your positioning of arguments is not correct. If I save this and rerun the file, Oh, we added a character that we don't want. So if I rerun the file now, it's going to say too few arguments. Expected at least one argument. So because we expected last name, so we can set the last name to just last. Save this, rerun. Oh, rerun a script. And it's going to say hello, Bob. You can also pass a named argument, such as using hashes. So I said these are my inputs. And I just want to do one thing, which is print dumper to do it's lowercase dumper backslash inputs i'm going to print actually the reference of this hash because it gives us a better visual structure to debug what we're passing here so if i do this and let's say i have number one which is going to hold a value of one and number two which is going to hold a value of two save this rerun the script is going to say that what we got here in the inputs named argument inputs which is hash which we reference, this is where we get this fine, nice structure, is a key that points to value 1 and key 2, which points to value 2. And this is very nice if you want to use named arguments because it allows you explicitly say what you want to pass in, such as last name, first name, and so on. Now, the last thing I want to show you is 
something that's called a Slurpee capture. And this is basically array which captures all the given arguments and you don't need to name them. For example, if I say at inputs, and I want to say that my first actual required input is name, but anything that we pass in afterwards is not deemed required, or we don't want to set default values. So what I can do, I can print out the name, what we're going to get, and I can also print out through dumper the input we're going to get. So again, we're getting array, right? So we're capturing all in array, but we're going to print out array reference by using this backslash, just for better formatting. So now, if the first argument is set to, let's say, John, we print it out, it's going to say that, yes, the first item we got is John, but we got no further up elements. And this is because we didn't pass anything extra. Now, if we want to pass more values, one, two, three, maybe let's drop in a hash ref here as well, with items A, B, and C. And if I save this, here we go. So the variable one, argument one, is John. This is what we're printing out here for this dumper function and the variable one for the second dumper print function holds value one, two, three, and a hash ref, which we passed in here. And this is using square brackets because we are referencing our array inputs. Now, this is it for this video. We looked at what are subroutines, how to create and interact with them. We also explore pro subroutine signatures and various ways how you can define them. I hope you found this video useful and I'll see you at the next one.